Okay, thank you for joining us. I'm Shirley Fenton, Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. We're very pleased to have Julie Kim from Emerges our guest, as our guest speaker. I have two announcements. Our Applied Health Informatics Boot Camp starts tomorrow. Uh, it will be a jam-packed two days uh, for those that are attending, and I think we've got about 60 people attending. Uh, and it will give a comprehensive overview to health informatics. So if you haven't signed up yet, I'm looking at some of the people in the audience, maybe you'd like to come. The next Smarter Health Seminar will be on Wednesday, June 27th, and will feature Dr. Octo Barnett. Dr. Barnett will be speaking on addressing clinician knowledge management needs. He is one of the fathers of health slash biomedical informatics. He's a professor at the Harvard Medical School and a senior research director at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's one of the few recipients of the prestigious Morris Cullen Award of Excellence from AMIA. Without a doubt, he is one of the world-class researchers in health informatics, and I really hope that you'll join us for that seminar on June 27th. So without any further ado, Dominic is going to introduce our speaker. So Dominic Covey, uh, would you please uh, take over? Well, Julie, welcome. We're glad to have you here and, uh, and had a little fun with Julie beforehand, so we'll try to be serious now as much as that difficult that is. Uh, I've only known Julie for about a year and a half or two years, so I've uh, been wandering around, and it was a very uh, good opportunity to get her to speak today on, on some of the consulting work that she's been doing and some of her views on consulting. She's a manager with Health Business Consulting at a, at a leading Canadian healthcare software consulting firm. I noticed that you had taken up multiple senior positions at consulting companies, four of them as I understand. That means you have no fixed address, I get it. <laughs> so uh, she's been around the consulting business quite a bit. Uh, very notably in 2000, she was awarded Coach's inaugural Stephen Using uh, 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 Scholarship Award. Uh, she holds an honors Bachelor's of Science in Health Studies Co-op uh, and recently completed her part-time studies for the Masters of Engineering at the University of Waterloo, so that's quite a background. Uh, in September, she, Julie will begin PhD studies at the University of Toronto. Where's that? And uh, uh, we'll continue working as a consultant uh, during that time. Julie, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Uh, it's hot in here, but I can't take my jacket off because the other end of the microphone isn't here. So if I pass out, please uh, just come and give me a hand. So, uh, as I said, welcome. Um, my name is Julie Kim, as uh, Dominic said. Um, I'll speak a bit about myself in the next couple of slides. Um, here's our agenda for today. First, I'll, st uh, I'll start off, like I said, uh, telling you a bit about me, my background in terms of education, work experience, and whatnot, maybe a little more. Um, I just wanted to present a few qualifiers about my presentation. Uh, following that, I wanted to speak a bit about consulting in general, um, and then we'll get into consulting uh, specifically in the e-health and health informatics industries. Uh, then we'll have a bit of a, Q a question and answer or a Q&A session. Um, I'm expecting to speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, and if possible, uh, it, would be, it would be great to hold questions uh, to the end, so please hold your questions. So, about me. Uh, I've been working in e-health and health informatics almost exclusively since my first co-op term at the University of Waterloo as an undergraduate student about 10 years ago. So I'm aging myself a bit. Oh, I didn't know the pencil moved. <laughs> um, so this is basically what I've done for 10 years, with the exception of two years where I went into the financial industry to do a bit of work in internal controls in Sarbanes-Oxley, and I'll speak about that, my decision to do that a little bit later. But I've come back into the industry and have worked uh, over the past five years almost exclusively as a management and information technology consultant uh, in four Ontario-based consulting practices. I do hold a, a Bachelor of Science in Health Studies at the University of Waterloo. Uh, following that, I pursued part-time studies to earn a Master's of Engineering at Waterloo. Um, and just recently completed that. As Dominic said, in September I'll start a PhD uh, in ind industrial engineering at U of T, uh, specializing in healthcare, healthcare systems, um, modeling, resource modeling, and things like that, which I believe will uh, greatly complement the work that I do in health informatics as a consultant. Other than that, to tell you a bit more about me, 
I love to golf. I have the itch. I have a bit of an unhealthy attachment to golf right now. Um, other than that, I love my puppies. I have two little Jack Russell Terriers for some reason, and uh, they uh, eat my shoes, they eat my couches, but I love them. Um, other than that, I love UFC, watching the fight on Saturday. I don't know if any of you are UFC fans. No? Uh, okay. <laughs> and I love stand-up comedy. That's what that mic over there means. Um, and a, a number of other varied interests, as you all probably have, but that's just a bit about me. So here are some examples of projects that I have worked on, and I'll get into what exactly some of these are later on when I begin to talk about what kinds of projects there are out there in e-health and health informatics. Um, and I won't, I won't belabor and I won't list everything off, but as you can say, see, it's a fairly diverse uh, list of, of work, and I suppose that's on purpose. Um, my personal philosophy is to stay as a generalist. One, because uh, I have a bit of an attention deficit and I need to always be doing different things and I need to have different things interest me and I suppose that is one of the reasons I went into consulting. I was approaching the end of my undergraduate studies and thinking I still don't know what I want to do. Uh, so I decided to do or to go into a job where I could do many many different things and where my role um, uh, and, and my, my scope per se would not be limited. Um, I guess my other philosophy is not to be pigeonholed into only one type of work. Um, for instance, I don't want to be a trainer. I don't want to only train people or, you know, clinicians or whatnot. I don't only want to do that for five years um, or, you know, be, be only a project manager or whatnot. I, I, I believe in getting um, a rich experience and, and uh, getting a feel for really all of the different types of work that are out there which also lends to, w would lend credibility to me, having been in different places, having worked in different environments with different stakeholders, et cetera. Um, and I guess the other thing is, uh, I always try to maintain transferable skills, so skills that I can take into other projects, into other industries as needed, into other projects, et cetera. And on the next slide are just uh, a listing of some past clients that I've worked with. As you can see, you know, it's quite a bit of, uh, quite a number of organizations that I've worked with and that's, you know, part of the benefit of being a consultant. I mean, a lot of your engagements are shorter term, some are longer term and, you know, sometimes you'll um, overlap. Um, but at any time I could have, you know, anywhere between two or five or six projects. And as a result, in a relatively short amount of time, you can end up working uh, for, for, for quite a, a variety of clients, which again adds to that sort of richness of experience that I was talking about. Okay, some qualifiers before I move on. First of all, what I'm about to say to you is from my perspective only, based on my experiences, my employers, the projects that I've been on, and my perceptions based on, you know, the things that I happen to notice or my, you know, sort of personality, I suppose. There are definitely those with more experience, more gray hairs, um, that can tell you a lot more about what I'm going to tell you. They may be able to say it more eloquently. My objective here is to give you a bit of an overview um, and hope to pique your interest a bit uh, in the field and perhaps in working uh, as a consultant or not in e-health and health informatics. And uh, some of the things I'll tell you are not necessarily going to be specific to consulting or health informatics. They'll apply to working in general or consulting in general or working in health informatics and not necessarily as a consultant. And of course your experiences will vary depending on, you know, what organization you work for, the kind of organizational culture in that environment. Uh, the manager that you have, the direct manager you have will be one of the most important uh, determinants of, say, how happy you are at work and the kinds of work you get and things like that. And of course, in the, the kinds of projects you're on. Am I speaking too fast? No? Everything's okay? Fantastic. So I will start off by talking to you a bit about consulting in general to sort of lay the framework uh, foundation down. So I went to Wikipedia, which not all believe is the most uh, reliable source of information to find a definition uh, of, of a consultant, just to make sure we have a common definition of that. So I'll start off by reading the first little bit. A, consulting, a consultant is a professional that provides expert advice 
in a particular domain or area of expertise, and it goes on and on. So basically, a consultant provides expertise. Uh, the word consultant is derived from the Latin consultare, meaning to discuss, uh, which from, uh, from which we also derive words such as uh, counsel and, and consul, um, which of course are you know, not um, obs obscure words. I'm sure we use these words on a sort of a regular basis. So the concept is pretty simple. Basically, a consultant is a professional, an expert in one or more things. So a little bit ab about consulting. There are a number of different kinds of consulting. Uh, you have your management consulting, which sometimes is also called strategy consulting. Um, typically, this is non-technical in nature. Uh, Typically, it's, about, it's all about helping an organization reach its goals uh, by, say, developing a strategic plan, going in and, say, performing a uh, operational review, um, a performance review, performance management, and things like that. Um, so again, typically non-technical in nature. Strategy consultants may go in and say, and, and say, fix a business, say, this is, this is what you need to do with your business to get it uh, profitable, to get it successful or whatnot. And again, I'm just giving you a bit of a high level overview. Uh, there's a bit of a fuzzy line between management and IT consulting or information technology consulting. Um, and, and the two often overlap. The IT consulting is centered around technology, but you don't necessarily have to be technical to work in IT consulting. It's basically, um, it, obviously in the, in the center of IT consulting are you know, systems and information, information technology, but you could be implementing those systems, you could be managing change around those systems, building those systems or whatnot. Uh, in, in more general terms, subject matter expertise or subject matter consulting can pertain to things like law, manufacturing, um, teaching, learning, like electronic learning or basically anything, basically providing a service where you give expertise to your client or your customer. Um, and then consulting can also just be some combination of the above. As I said, you know, the lines are kind of fuzzy. There are many different kinds of consulting firms and practices, uh, and I've, I'm just uh, sort of generalizing here. Uh, there, there's quite a, a, a large continuum. And at one end, we have your large sort of diversified companies, say your you know, Deloitte and Touche, Accenture's, uh, whatnot. Uh, large, large firms, multinational, um, thousands upon, you know, tens of thousands of people, often with different uh, practices, healthcare consulting, um, in, uh, CRM, uh, um, you know, implementation, all sorts of different kinds of consulting. Uh, you have your sort of more medium firms, which I might define as, you know, a thousand employees plus. Um, boutique firms, which can be anywhere from you know, one person to say 15 or 20 or maybe even more. Usually they're a niche firm specializing in a certain area and like specializing it and, and, and just only doing that kind of work. For instance, there's a firm in Toronto that only does privacy and security consulting. That's their bread and butter. There's also the option where one can be an independent consultant. So basically, you go in and consult to clients, but you don't work on behalf of a company. You, you say, form your own uh, business. You get a GST number, and you are, you are basically the consultant. And there are ups and downs to these sort of things. Um, you, you, know, you have to have a, a large client base. You have to be responsible for you know, the, the work that you get. And uh, often, it can be difficult, particularly when you're first starting out. So that's all I'll say about that, just because I'm sort of uh, framing this discussion to uh, be delivered to, say, a student, a, a new, new graduate audience or a student audience. Lately, though, there's an increase in uh, uh, internal consulting and companies creating sort of groups within their companies to do internal consulting, uh, mostly around things like organizational change within the company or implementing sort of systems within their own company, um, which has its ups and downs. Usually when a company has um, uh, has to cut back financially, uh, that's usually considered the fat and is usually sort of the first to go. But I, I, I just wanted to mention it here um, because some companies have started to establish internal consulting um, uh, functions to cut costs because consultants, as I'll discuss later on, can be sort of expensive at times. 
So why use consultants? You have a company, you employ a whole bunch of people, uh, why would you go outside? So there are a number of reasons uh, which pertain, you know, some of which will pertain to some companies and some not. Uh, sometimes the expertise or service that, you, that a company needs uh, is, is one that they only need for, say, six months or two months or whatnot, and they don't have the expertise in-house and it's not worth it or, or not feasible to, you know, hire someone to come in for only two months or six months. Sometimes uh, that skill set is, is just not in the company or not readily available. It might be uh, fully utilized elsewhere, depending on how, say, busy the company is. Um, consulting firms can have, you know, sort of deeper pockets, especially the larger ones. They have a lot of resources uh, if something happens to the project and they need to bring more resources on. Um, and often, particularly with the medium size and larger consulting firms, um, they have methodologies and they have um, models and methodologies to really do this work right because this is what they this is what they do this is what they focus on so they have models for strategic planning they have models for organizational redevelopment and and process uh, flow work and re redesign and things like that which some of these companies just might not have because that's not what they do um, consultants also provide objectivity uh, you, it's a third party coming in and basically telling you how to solve a problem or what, or what you're doing wrong or how to fix something, uh, which is um, often, you know, what companies need because, <clears throat> excuse me, your employees might tell you what you want to hear. So that's essentially the point there. Um, often companies will pay for consultants with sort of a separate purse um, in, in their budget. They may have, say, money left over to fix a certain problem. So um, they'll pay for the consultants with that money as opposed to, say, your overall sort of HR bucket, which will be used to pay your salaries. As well, often, uh, perhaps depending on the consulting firm that you use, uh, having your consultants do a piece of work for you will lend credibility to that type of work. If, uh, if there is something to be done, say if a consultant provides a strategic plan for you and they give you sort of this document and you have to implement it or you have to live into it for the next three to five years, the company might buy into it more if it was uh, uh, developed by, say, a credible consulting firm, um, and you may have, a, you know, you have, you, you, you might have more people listening and actually having it acted on. So those are just a few reasons, again, that may not always apply, um, uh, and, and of course there are more, like I said. Benefits of consulting. So there are a number of benefits of consulting, and I'm going to approach this from the point of view of the actual consultant or the person that wants to go into consulting. As I mentioned, you have a variety of work, and you have a lot of work. You have a lot of potential work to do. So if you want exposure, go into consulting. If you want to be able to do a lot of different things and sort of figure out what you want to do, um, and also to be sort of a jack of all trades or a generalist, consulting is a very viable option for you. You get a lot of exposure as well. I mean, because you do a lot of different work with a lot of different clients, you meet a lot of contacts. Uh, if you're a people person or if you eventually want to start your own business, um, uh, that's a really good way to get exposure. And consulting firms will say often send you to conferences or you can go speak um, and get yourself known and get exposure in that way. In general, consulting firms pay fairly well, especially for students coming out of school um, consulting firms expect that they will, especially some of the larger firms, will expect that you will really work for them. And as such, they'll pay you well. They'll pay you usually um, on par or better than, say, uh, say a hospital would. Excuse me, like I'm just referring to this industry. Say a hospital would or, you know, a, a another sort of company might pay you. So that's usually sort of an upside. Um, Travel and expenses. So you may have to travel quite a bit. Uh, you know, when you're working for a consulting firm, there's work all around. I know right now in this industry, there's a lot going out on the on the West Coast. And I was interviewing with companies a couple years ago, and uh, two of the four I was speaking to said, "Okay, we can hire you right away, but will you work in Alberta or will you work in BC?" So travel is often implicit in consulting, and this can be pretty glamorous in the beginning, particularly when you you know, are coming into school and you've been eating a lot of instant noodles or craft dinner <laughs> because it's very glamorous thought to, you know, be flown to your, your destination and, and uh, be able to eat whatever you want to eat and sort of expense it on the client or the company or whatnot. Um, 
that's definitely a perk that I, you know, that, that, I, that I was drawn to in the beginning. Uh, and, it's, it, and it's exciting to travel and get to go around and sort of on the company's bill, so to speak. I mean, you're working, but you also get to be often in a nice city or whatnot. Consulting usually will all offer some flexibility. You will work a lot, but you, you know, can work nights or weekends or whatever, and, or whatnot, excuse me. And uh, often, you know, you'll have some flexibility during the day to do, you know, to sort of work when you want to work, but you do have to get it all done. There's also a lot of pressure to succeed. Consul in the consulting firm, you're basically the product. The, the company makes money when you work or when you're billing. Um, as a result, you will work a lot, and this pressure to succeed uh, will, can potentially you know, build you a very good CV and a very good sort of um, background of, of experience. <clears throat> now I'm going to get into the challenge of, of consulting, which are <laughs> sort of along the same lines. As you'll notice, this is the same list. Um, because there's two sides to every story. You will have a, vari uh, a, a, a high variety of work and a lot of work, but my personal sort of challenge has been, you know, I've done a whole lot of stuff, but I'm not an expert in any one or two things, which I'm sort of grappling now with now, because sometimes you wonder, what do I do? What do I really do? Um, and that's sort of a difficult question to answer when you're a generalist and you sort of do everything. Um, so that's that, I mean, unless, you, unless you like it. And yes, there is a lot of work, so maybe you don't want to work quite that much. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you're working late nights and you're working weekends. Uh, so that, you know, that definitely can be a challenge, especially, you know, when you're just out of school. I mean, I guess it depends what perspective you take. You know, you're young. Um, you can say, I'm young, I can work a lot, I have a lot of time, I have no kids or whatnot. Or you can say, I'm young, this is the first time, or this is the only time I'm going to not have kids or not have responsibilities, so, you know, I want to have fun or whatnot. So, myself, I try to find sort of that, that balance, but it can be difficult often with consultants, and you may, you'll meet a lot of consultants that um, are in the early stages of their career that are consumed with working and unhealthy at that. Um, you will get a lot of exposure, but if you're not prepared for that exposure, if you're not prepared to meet those people um, and, and to tackle those problems, uh, you could get caught with your pants down. Um, money. So I have a question. I have a little icon there with a question mark with a bunch of uh, loonies and a toonie at the bottom because given the amount of hours you may end up working, I mean, it's, it's not atypical to find particularly a junior consultant working, say, 60 hours a week. You are paid a fairly high salary, but you divide that by, you know, say the number of hours that you're really working, depending again on your employer and depending on, say, your bonus structure or whatever, maybe you're not making all that much money. So just something to consider. Travel and expenses, there's a downside to that too. Have you heard of the Froshman 15? Where, or the, the Frosh 15, you come to school, there's a meal plan, you're sort of, you're always working, you're always up, you're eating late, you're eating a lot, so you gain 15 pounds. The same thing happens in consulting, and the same thing happened to me in consulting. Um, I gained, actually I gained 20 pounds, eating all this, you know, cheese and wine or whatnot. Uh, so there's a, <laughs> a price to be paid. And traveling is not always glamorous. One of my first projects was uh, in Sarnia, Ontario. So that doesn't evoke the same images as jetting off to, say, New York City or even Vancouver or something like that. So, yes, there's two sides to every story. The flexibility that I spoke to you about has a downside as well. You may have a flexible schedule, but you are usually always accessible. My Blackberry is never really more than three feet away from me. It's like an electronic sort of dog leash. And again, I speak in generalities, but this, this can easily be the case for a lot of people. There is a lot of pressures to succeed, and as you can tell by this guy over here, can lead to a lot of stress. And if not managed properly, if you don't have the proper sort of schedule in your life or the right work-life balance, which a lot of consulting companies talk about, but not all of them really care about, uh, perhaps, um, it, it, it can lead to sort of this nasty cycle where you work so much, you don't exercise well, you don't eat well. So something to watch out for. So what does it take to be a consultant? I think it takes many things, and these are just a few that I've listed here. And again, this will depend on, you know, remember back to my qualifiers. In general, you do need a lot of drive and energy to be a consultant. You will probably work a lot. You, you are basically there to solve problems. 
And particularly in the beginning, when you don't have, say, 15 or 20 years of experience to actually consult, you're probably doing the grunt work. You're probably working twice as hard as the managers or the uh, partners that you're working for. So you need to have that drive to succeed and you need to have that energy to, uh, to help you last. Uh, you definitely need organizational skills, especially if you're going to be working on multiple projects. Um, at larger firms, you'll be perhaps working for multiple project managers, um, projects with conflicting timelines, overlapping timelines or whatnot. So you definitely have to be on top of everything. I can't stress enough how important it is to have good communication skills, and by that I mean good oral communication skills as well as written communication skills. Particularly as a junior consultant, you'll, you'll do a lot of writing. You may do a lot of proposal writing, uh, and you may be involved in actual development of your deliverables, like the plans that you deliver or um, final reports. Uh, and the other reason is that you will most likely be working in teams, which leads to my next point as well. Um, uh, teams, not only teams, but clients. So you have to be likable. You have to pretend to be likable, uh, whatever's easier for you. Um, uh, but you do have to have that interpersonal, uh, interpersonal ability. Again, with consulting, you are the client. Uh, uh, you are the product, excuse me. So you have to be able to be sold, basically, and the client has to like you. Um, and you know, a lot of people will tell you that you know, eight or nine times out of ten, Getting a new project from a client is not necessarily about um, your experience or uh, your ability to sell um, or, or, or you know, to, to write good proposals or whatnot. It'll be the contacts that you know, the people that like you, that like working with you um, and, and want to give you sort of repeat business. You also have to be quite adaptable. Things will change quite rapidly uh, and you just need to be able to uh, keep up with that change, especially if you're working on, on multiple projects. And lastly, it will be important to uh, be able to keep up in a fast-paced environment. Consulting firms are often quite busy. Again, you are the product, so they make money when you work. Okay, now I'm going to get into uh, consulting in the e-health and, and health informatics industries. And again, we're going to hold questions till the end. I'll just give you a bit of a high-level primer. I'm certainly not here to uh, lecture to you about what health informatics really is. I assume most people um, know what health informatics is and also like I said you know there are a lot of people who can talk to you more about uh, in greater detail and with more credibility about the industry. At the end of the presentation I will give you a slide with a, a few resources uh, if, if you're uh, interested in, in learning some more. So I'll start off by telling you a bit about the environment and what health and what what e-health and health informatics really is and the two terms are act actually used interchangeably quite a bit but I'll give you a picture of sort of the scenario we have in healthcare in Canada our healthcare system we have a lot of problems to be solved in the healthcare system you've probably all heard of the problems with wait times uh, the long wait times uh, that that there are to say get surgeries done or get procedures or to see specialists there are a lot of inefficiencies with the system with respect to how it operates, uh, either in, in an organization or among organizations, between organizations. Uh, you'll hear a lot about a shortage of healthcare professionals and uh, differences in, in the supply of healthcare professionals in different geographic areas. Um, you'll hear a lot about the need for, say, health promotion to improve health and health status as opposed to uh, the traditional sort of um, uh, medical model where you just sort of uh, fix problems after they happen or give drugs to folks or just treat them after, after they get sick. Uh, after SARS, there was a lot of emphasis on public health surveillance, so the need to know sort of what's going on on the public health sort of um, level to know, say, when a disease is coming or when an epidemic is coming. And I'll get into this a bit more afterwards. Right now, uh, there isn't the sort of decision support at the bedside when, say, your, your, your physician is talking, she's look, your physician's looking at you, looking at your medic, medical conditions or whatnot. They don't have the support or information there to help them make the right decisions for you, whether it's about how to treat you or what, uh, what prescriptions to give you or whatnot. Um, there also is 
the need to make healthcare information better and more accessible. You'll go to, say, a clinic right now, and they will take down, you'll, they'll ask you about your allergies. They'll ask you about what happened, why did you collapse last night, or whatnot. And they'll keep that in their clinic, and then, say, next month, you'll go to your, you'll go to the emergency room, perhaps, and they will not know any of that information because it's stuck in this one little clinic. So I'm just giving you some sort of high-level um, overview of what sort of the environment is. There is a lot to be done in healthcare through the power of technology and the, through the power of information and information management. Um, and healthcare is traditionally known as being a laggard. Uh, the other industries have adapted technology uh, sooner and, and, and perhaps better, but, but uh, you know, so a lot of these things are kind of arguable, but I, that's sort of the high level. So I don't know if many of you have heard of Canada Health InfoA. InfoA is a national nonprofit organization, and they're basically all about uh, implementing a electronic health record across Canada. Their goal is to have an interoperable electronic healthcare record covering 50% of Canadians by 2010. So sort of what I was just talking to you about, all of your healthcare information basically electronic as opposed to on paper somewhere in one organization. Uh, and I won't talk too much about uh, InfoA because InfoA, like I said, is about the electronic health record and there's more than the electronic health er, uh, record when it comes to e-health and health informatics. But InfoA basically has nine investment programs. Now, InfoA works with the provinces and the territories to fund projects to get this electronic health record established across Canada. The investment programs are telehealth, registries, public health surveillance, drug information systems, lab information systems, diagnostic imaging, interoperable electronic health record, innovation and adoption, and infrastructure. And if you have any questions about these, I'm not sure how uh, much you folks know about the uh, industry or what these things are, but I can certainly speak to any questions you have about this in the question and answer period. So I'm just going to skip the next slide in the interest of time. <clears throat> And now I'm going to get to sort of the funner part where I uh, speak to the kinds of projects that you could be working on if you worked in the e-health and health informatics industries. I'll start off the electronic health record or, or the EHR as it's often called. Um, working in this industry, you could be involved in the development of electronic health records of the actual software, of the actual systems. Uh, the deployment or the implementation, depending on your definition, of these to the actual users and the hospitals and sites and whatnot. You can be involved in testing, uh, whether it's like software testing, integration testing, or user testing. Uh, as you can see, there's a great variety. You could be involved in training, training nurses, physicians, other end users, um, and evaluation, actually. And, and, and often uh, research is done sort of academic research is done in this area. Um, this is evaluating the electronic health record and the benefits of the electronic health record or how well it was implemented or whatnot. <clears throat> Another aspect is clinical uh, decision support and corporate decision support. I just put them um, in the same bullet here for the sake of real estate, but they're actually very t two very different things. Clinical decision support, I sort of alluded to earlier, where this is information uh, to support decision making clinically. So again, to help your physician figure out uh, what best to say prescribe to you or what treatment is best um, uh, to, to give to you at that point in time. Physicians and of course any other healthcare professionals. Corporate decision support is a bit different. Hospitals uh, are not, well, a lot of people would consider hospitals to be businesses. They're not necessarily for profit and they don't necessarily have this, the same sort of drivers, but they do have boards, they do have objectives, and they have a certain budget, so they need to know how best to spend their money. So hospitals, like businesses, need to know uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it. They need to know what their resources are doing, they need to know um, statistics, they need to know about their finances or whatnot. So corporate decision support systems are about bringing that information together, often in a format of, say, a dashboard, or that was the term that was being used a couple of years ago, to provide the right information, and I guess this is the key, to provide the right information at the right time to the decision makers so they can make better decisions. Another aspect is diagnostic imaging, or PACS, which stands for Picture Archiving and Communication Systems. So right now, uh, 
often when you go to get, say, an x-ray done, uh, it'll actually print out on those films. And again, it'll be kept in sort of m in one place. Um, a PAC system will replace that and will make everything digital. Uh, so it's available, say, right away to you, and it's uh, stored and can be easily shared with other healthcare providers. Clinical documentation uh, pertains to both nurses and physicians. Right now, when you go to, say, a hospital or a clinic, uh, your care provider may very well be writing notes sort of on one piece of paper or one form over here, again, on paper, uh, not shared perhaps, or not well shared, or illegible. So clinical documentation projects work to make that documentation electronic and again available to uh, other healthcare providers as needed. Patient tracking um, can be a, uh, pertain can, can pertain to say an emergency department where you need to move patients around quite a bit and you need to know where they are at a particular time could be a matter of life and death. Uh, surveillance systems I spoke to you before when I was telling you about public health and the ability to uh, track sort of certain symptoms even, or conditions uh, to uh, pre-warn you or to sort of predict when, uh, say, an epidemic is coming or a public health, um, a, a public health uh, event is coming. Telemedicine is kind of cool. Telemedicine is uh, important in Canada, particularly because we have a lot of geographic barriers. We have a whole lot of people living close to the U.S. border. We have a few people, well a lot of people, but relatively speaking a lot of people, a few people living sort of up north where uh, there aren't a lot of hospitals and where there aren't a lot of healthcare uh, specialists or academic centers. So telehealth, telemedicine sort of uh, helps to bridge that gap. If you um, need a specialist and you live say up in, pick a place up north, Wawa, and there's no expert heart surgeon in Wawa, well, you know, there was a time when, you know, these patients would have to drive down to, say, Toronto or the next, you know, uh, um, hub and actually come for a consult, go back home and then come back, you know, weeks later for their actual surgery. Well, telemedicine uh, helps to alleviate this and helps to sort of bridge this gap by allowing consults and, and, and even more uh, be done remotely. Uh, personal health information uh, pertains to basically you accessing your own information. Uh, right now, like you can log on to say your CIBC website or, or some other um, banking website and you can see exactly how much money you have. You can see, you can actually move money from one account to another, send it to other people, but you do not have your health information, all your immunizations, your past medical history, your allergies or anything like that online or available to you, or, and, and nor are you able to uh, update it or correct it. So there is some work being done by some folks to, uh, and again, this varies by jurisdiction, to, to get these sort of initiatives up and running. Lab information systems pertain to, you know, lab work, your blood work or whatnot, that in the past has taken a whole lot of work to do um, and a lot of time to get, you know, the results in or the specimens out or whatnot. Same for drug information systems. Uh, you'd be shocked at how many people die every year um, by means of the prescription pad that the doctor writes your prescription on based on uh, uh, bad writing or misinterpretation um, or, you know, just laziness perhaps. Um, a lot of people die from the prescription pad and imagine those deaths being uh, eliminated with a drug information system that allows a doctor to, uh, one, have decision support, um, but secondly to, um, uh, say, check off a, a, ch a checkbox or two and, uh, you know, do away with the eligibility problems um, and have that prescription, say, sent automatically, electronically to a pharmacy, have it dispensed, et cetera. There's a lot of work also being done in privacy and security because with all this talk about information, health information being shared uh, with people and among organizations or whatnot, uh, there's a lot of concern about privacy and security. A lot of, uh, this is a very sort of public and contentious issue. And there are a number of people that are working to uh, solve these problems and to, to lessen the, the barriers here. Uh, there's also uh, informatics. 
um, actually working with the information. It's often said that, you know, in healthcare, there's a lot of data. There's a whole lot of data, but there's not a whole lot of information or meaningful information. And informa informaticians, excuse me, will work to make the data basically into information and useful information. You can also work in solution development pertaining to sort of um, any solutions, whether it's electronic health record or, or any other kind of software. And as I mentioned before, there's also the element of evaluation, and a lot of consulting firms will work to help evaluate, say, a project that's been done or uh, a, a software rollout or even the uh, effectiveness of, of software in general. And in all of these things, you can take one or more of a, a number of roles and responsibilities. I've just listed a few of them here. Uh, often when consultants first start off, they, they take on the role of, say, a business analyst. Again, it's very general. You're basically analyzing business processes or the business of your client. Uh, there's also project management where you actually you take a sort of a finite project and you manage it logistically. You manage the resources, whatnot, and you track the time, the budget. Um, I'm not so much a fan of project management. It's more you know, administrative, but it's making sure everybody gets everything done. And often you need to have some sort of context or understanding of what your uh, staff do or what your team does to be able to do this effectively. And it's quite, it's quite an, I shouldn't say an art, but there are a number of designations and there are a number of associations that um, um, revolve around proper uh, methodical project management. Related to that is program management sort of on a higher level. You can also work in uh, sort of the technical side of it or technical arch architecture side of the uh, equation. I, I list informatics here as well. Uh, change management is an area that I'm uh, becoming uh, more specialized in right now. Change management is kind of neat because it incorporates some sort of psycho psychological elements and sociological elements as well. Change management is essentially how to uh, manage people, uh, deal with change, whether it's uh, an implementation of a product because a lot of times people don't want to change. People do, do not want a system because the, they've been working with paper for 20 years and you're trying to come in and implement a system. So there's a number of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done in change management for sure. Uh, the average age of a nurse last I heard in Ontario is something like 47, 48 years, uh, which presents some barriers as well. I mean, of course, I, I mean, I've known a lot of older nurses and physicians who are quite keen on technology, but a lot of them aren't. Uh, we're fortunate to have been raised in sort of the information age where we all have the internet. We all went through high school and university with, you know, computers and uh, networks and software programs. And it's, you know, second nature to us, but it's not to everybody. Uh, so there needs to be a lot of work done to help facilitate that change. Business process analysis and redesign is often implicit in these kind of projects because if you were, say, building a solution, you need to know how things are currently done, what the processes are. Um, and even if you're not dealing with a solution, often you, you will go into an organization um, and fix like, or provide a solution to the way that things are done. One of the first projects I had when I went uh, into consulting was to go into the outpatient mental health unit of uh, a hospital downtown and basically look at the way they were registering patients because it, it was very inefficient. They were using a lot of paper forms and they were having staffing issues. So basically our job was to go in there, look at they were, what they were doing, figure out how they could do it better. Um, and, in, uh, and included in that is, is how they could better use technology or their forms or whatnot and then provide a solution. So I think that's pretty fun. As I said, consulting often is problem solving. Um, another kind of work that you could do in consulting uh, pertains to requirements, definition, and management. If you're not building a solution, you may be helping a client to find a solution. So going in and talking with their folks about what they need, whether it's in, say, an operating room, this is a project I'm doing right now, uh, or an emergency department, they need a system and they need, they need you to go, out, go and help them find a system. So the first thing you have to do is really figure out what they need. So you talk to their staff, you figure out what they need in terms of functional requirements, what do you want the system to do, technical requirements, what does this uh, system have to interface with, or you know, how quickly do you need the information or whatnot, or what does it have to look like, um, and, and managing those requirements as they say change over time or whatnot. Tender management is sort of along those lines where you help a client to go out and find a system. You deal with the contract, you write them a request for proposal, you manage the process, et cetera. 
uh, which I happen to, be, uh, to, to have done a lot with just because one of the companies I work for did a lot of that, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and you could also, as I mentioned before, uh, work in training and along with that end user you know, documentation for training like manuals and things like that or actually delivering the training. Um, and the other aspect is documentation, aligned, uh, it, it, which aligns well with uh, the training. So here I'm just listing off a few potential employers, and of course I had to put Emerges at the top. Emerges is actually a, a, a software vendor. The history is that I joined uh, a, com a small company called Dinmar about a year and a half ago, and a few months later we were bought by Emerges, uh, which is primarily a software uh, company, but we are their consulting arm, which you will find sometimes. A lot of times software vendors will have consulting arms, uh, but they primarily sometimes uh, just implement the software systems that the uh, parent company actually makes. Deloitte & Touche is another one, multinational company. They have a healthcare practice, a very strong healthcare practice in most of the major cities in uh, Canada. Same with PricewaterhouseCoopers. IBM's consulting practice, um, well, they, they've always had a consulting practice, but a few years ago they bought the consulting practice from PricewaterhouseCoopers who is actually building another, their own, uh, re rebuilding a consulting practice right now. CGI is an, uh, also an, a, a big one. They're also a software vendor or software systems provider. Accenture is an, uh, a, another big one. It used to be called uh, Anderson Consulting. A lot of consulting firms actually came from uh, uh, accounting firms or the big five accounting firms. And many of them uh, in recent years have separated themselves from the accounting firms for reasons that are probably familiar to a lot of you, having to do with you know, Enron, uh, financial scandals and things like that. Uh, there's also a company in Toronto called the Courtyard Group. There are about 140 people strong and they do IT consulting. They also do healthcare uh, system consulting, management consulting as well. Uh, there's a small company called Praxia that does sort of, I think, the same kind of work that Courtyard does. Uh, I worked a number of years ago for a small consulting firm called Health Tech. Um, that's actually grown, and they, they, they do a lot of work in implementation, particularly uh, pertaining to the Meditech system, which is a hospital information system that's very popular health information system, and it's uh, in about 70% of the hospitals in Ontario, I think. Anzen is a small firm in Toronto that specializes in privacy and uh, security work, and there's also Sierra Systems, very strong on the West Coast, and they do a lot of different things, and healthcare is just one of them. And there are many more. I've just listed off a few here. I'll give you my contact number at the end, and uh, you can feel free to write me if you want more information about potential employers or um, anything else, really. I'm coming near the end of my uh, deck here, and this slide is about why you should work in e-health and informatics. Well, I can't tell you why you should, really, but I'll tell you uh, what draws me to the field. As I mentioned, I took two years off a few years ago to leave health uh, informatics and e-health and, and work at the bank for a couple of years. Just to know, because I mean, this is the only thing I'd ever done since I was 19, basically. Uh, and I needed to know I could work in another industry. I, needed to, I, I wanted to know how things were done in other industries. And I didn't uh, want to be pigeonholed, so to speak, too early on in my career and have myself only have done one thing. Um, but as you can see, I've come back, and I guess the reason is, um, for me, it's about uh, what I contribute or really what I do at the end of the day. And I'll tell you, it does not make my heart flutter to help a bank get rich or help them attest to their financial controls. It just doesn't matter to me. It matters to me to help advance the healthcare system and improve uh, the healthcare system through the use of you know technologies and information. So. Uh, that's basically the reason that I'm here. The other thing is the health informatics and e-health industries, I would consider an intelligent community. I know that Waterloo was bestowed the title of being an intelligent community, and I, I, I do believe it, but I do believe that uh, that title can also be given to you know, e-health and health informatics overall. There's a lot of, uh, of intelligence in the industry. There's a lot of smart people working in the industry, not only you know, the consultants or the software vendors, but the clients as well. Um, there's a lot of smart people that work in healthcare, and I don't know about you, but I believe firmly in, say, mentorship, and, 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 and you are what you surround yourself with. 
Uh, so it's, an, it, it's sort of an environment that I like to be in, and I find sort of fertile um, area to be in for, for developing myself and, and my, own, um, my own skills. It's also quite the growing industry. Um, I, I showed you a slide on InfoWay before. InfoWay is funded by the federal government, and they were just given, uh, what was it, 300 billion more dollars to um, advance the EHR in Canada. So there's a lot of money. There's going to be a lot of activity uh, in the next uh, you know, 10, 20 years. So a lot of people are actually um, creating businesses to come into the industry. A lot of people are joining the industry even mid-career to uh, get in on it. Um, and I spoke a bit to my last point, which is contribution and purpose. Uh, a lot of people think a job is a job, but really you do, y you work 50% of your waking hours. And if you're going to be working anyways, if you're going to be there anyways, you've got to do something you love, or you want to do something that makes you feel like you contribute, whatever floats your boat. But essentially, that, that's why I'm here. Here's a few resources for you, not many. I actually added one to a version that I didn't uh, put up here. Um, InfoWay uh, is, is a good resource. They give you a lot of information on the EHR and the advancement of the EHR, where it's going. Um, and, and, and it gives you more information about those investment programs that I listed off for you. Coach is also uh, a good resource. They're the, uh, so our sort of industry association in Canada, and we just had a, um, a conference in uh, Quebec City that was great. Uh, lots of great presentations and poster sessions and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and good fun. Uh, if you're into consulting in general, there's a book that a lot of consulting companies will tout as sort of the Bible of consulting, and it's called The Trusted Advisor, and it's by David Meister. You can pick it up basically anywhere. Um, uh, the logo that I didn't, uh, that, that I put in the, the newer version, but that's not here, uh, is W-I-H-I-R, which is this institute, and I apologize for leaving that out, Dominic. Uh, but the Institute, of course, is a great uh, source of information. And they, ha they have these seminars every, Wednesday, every couple Wednesdays, is it? Um, and, and they're a good source for uh, information if you want to learn some more about the industry. <gasps> questions. So you'll, hear, you'll see my, uh, my info here. If you need any, uh, if you have any questions, you want some more resources or whatnot, I am more than happy to provide that information to you. So I just want to remind you this time that uh, if you do have a question, uh, to that, that you, you need to speak into the mic because this is being recorded. Well, so I'll give you the microphone uh, <laughs> so you can take ask a question. So, questions. Uh, it's basically just about the, the clinical decision support that you do. Um, you say that you help doctors prescribe medicines. How exactly, as a consultant, are you doing that? Yes, I'm not doing that. I'm, I, yes, clinical decision support systems, well, and it'll, the definitions vary. Um, well, I, I suppose that was more about industry in general, one aspect of the industry, in ge uh, which is clinical decision support. Um, and that's basically working towards building solutions or bringing the right information to the clinician at the point of care to help them make those decisions, the clinical decisions. For instance, um, so ideal world, patient comes in and something hurts really bad right over here and they have four or five different symptoms. A decision support system may allow the doctor to enter in those systems, right, and then have, uh, it won't look like this, but have, you know, a bunch of information, you know, the system will do a bunch of work and, and, and he'll be presented with a number of different scenarios or a number of different illnesses it may be, which he probably wouldn't have been able to do in his head. On, do you know what I mean? Given the, the multitude of different combinations and, and number of different symptoms. So that's the way that, that system would support a decision made in the clinical setting. Do you know what I mean? Do yeah. you actually see doctors like implementing your system, like given, I don't know, a pride, I guess. Pride. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, it's, uh, hmm. The issue of physician adoption is sort of difficult in general for a number of complex reasons. Um, hmm. There are a lot of reasons that physicians will uh, bring up when they don't want to implement technology, and that's, that's quite frankly one of them. Um, not, not really like, you know, not, they won't say, oh, I have a lot of pride and I don't want to do this, but they, a, a lot of times it's a sense of ownership, whether it's physicians or other people, because they feel like you're taking the power away from them, when in fact you're just trying to provide them with 
perhaps more power at their fingertips. So that's definitely something that, that's a dynamic that we see, definitely. And, and what I just described is certainly not something that is prevalent in healthcare environments, but it's more uh, something that we're working towards for everyone's good. If I may make a comment sure. uh, on that, the Dr. Barnett will be speaking about that. Yes. I mean, that's the focus of his talk, is to provide clinicians with that immediate knowledge management to uh, sets of tools. Mm -hmm. And he's developed over the, uh, how many decades have, has he been working on this? So he'll be speaking to his experience and uh, expertise in that area. Which day is that, John? That is June 27th here at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Barnett, he developed a system called DXplain, and it's become probably one of the most noteworthy clinical decision support systems. But what you're saying back and forth is true. Physicians uh, sometimes look at these systems and say, what good is it? What would point? If you're not able to make the decision yourself, you know, then why are you in that position? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what's been shown is in very difficult diagnoses, not necessarily a pain over here, but <laughs> in extremely difficult diagnoses, that can be a real asset, at least in double checking your own decision. So you get a machine response. And if you want to know about this, if you went to almost any emergency department, Grand River, a good example, have electrocardiogram done. A decision support algorithm has actually been built into the ECG cart now. Uh, these, this used to be fancy clinical decision support research. Now it's in the cart, electronically programmed into the cart. And it will give you measurements of the electrocardiogram as well as clinical decisions on you know, if it's a right bundle branch block or an infarct or whatever it might be. So this stuff is, it works, but it will work primarily in the background in the future. I don't see physicians entering symptoms and waiting for a mm -hmm. response and things like that. I don't see that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. Just as another side to that, uh, our guest speaker at the boot camp, uh, Dr. Catherine Schreier, has done a lot of research on the, uh, how uh, physicians are educated and with the way they are trained to think, to make decisions. And so I think this is a very much a part of the dynamic of working with such systems. She's going to be speaking on the dark side of health informatics, so huh. <laughs> it should be a lot of fun tomorrow night. Excellent. Right. I'm going to call her Catherine Vader. <laughs> Catherine Vader. I, th I think a lot of the problem, too, is um, often, and traditionally in, in, in this industry, uh, solutions are developed and they're just sort of implemented and there hasn't been much thought or effort or money put towards how it's put in or educating the physicians or other, you know, the nurses or other potential end users to really know what the benefits are or to even frame it in a way that, that it would be received well from the end user. So there's, it's, it's multifaceted, the problem. So other questions from people here? Any thoughts? I'll, I'll ask you one practical one. Please do. Uh, you talked about time management. As you know, that, that is a big issue. Uh, at one point, I was, as a consultant, managing 35 projects simultaneously with two people. So it's very, very, uh, it can be very, very challenging. How have you found, uh, what have you found to be the, the tools and tricks of time management in that kind of environment? Okay. One, uh, exercise is very important. I start every morning off with a run. I actually find that it gives me more energy so I can get more done in less time. The other thing is I find that the more that's on my plate, the faster I get everything done and often I get it done with better quality. So um, one of my tactics is, is actually to keep myself busy. At a, I think there's a tipping point that I keep myself busy over a certain level, otherwise I'm not as uh, efficient, if that makes sense. Uh, I guess the other thing is I don't see anything as a barrier. Um, as, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm starting a PhD in September and I've been doing a part-time master's and a lot of people think, oh, that's crazy, how are, how are you doing that? How do you possibly make the time? And quite frankly, I, I don't know if I do this on purpose, but I don't think of it as a big deal. I just think these are the things that I need to get done, these are the things that I want to get done, and I get them done. I don't spend any time feeling sorry for myself or you know, wondering how I'm going to get everything done. I just Get it done. How do you keep track of all those projects, though, this two to six projects? What do you do? Do you keep lists? Do you, what, do you, what is your, your method of mad, uh, yeah. managing madness? I keep lists. Actually, I haven't found anything in the Outlook or, or the Microsoft suite that works uh, very good. I tried, you know, the tasks. Um, I actually just um, I, I keep one Word document or sometimes an Excel spreadsheet, d depending on, you know, how much information uh, I, you know, I need to keep about each. And 
um, I just update that sort of on a regular basis, really. Um, and with time, you sort of develop your own sort of systems. Sometimes it depends on the project that you're working on as well. But yes, I, I do wish I had an assistant. <laughs> I have one question. It goes back to your slide on uh, different uh, uh, organizations and the culture of their of their of their organization. Do you have any illustrations of that? I'm curious as oh, to sure. the the range of cultures within an organization. Sure. Yeah, I'll start off by telling you that uh, my consulting career started off with one of the big five consulting firms, so multinational, tens of thousands of people, um, and this company was very uh, very well. It was big, like I said, and, and, and basically with the big consulting firms often, their philosophy is to bring in sort of the junior consultants and a whole bunch of them, and, and this is what we, I don't think they say this out loud, but uh, it, um, they basically take a whole bunch of junior consultants and they work them to the ground, and a few of them will stay, and a few of them will die. No, they won't die, <laughs> but a few of them will burn out. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, this is what a lot of people think about, say, large first-year science classes. They start off fairly large, but they dwindle over time, and then you get, you know, the survivors sort of at the end. So that was a bit of a challenging environment. It was, uh, all of, it was a lot of competition, for one. Um, you were working with a lot of people your own age, uh, which, you know, has good sides and bad sides to it. Um, but also, there was quite an emphasis on billable hours. Uh, our team, at the end of every month, would have, to have a meeting, and, and, and they would put a slide up at the end of the meeting um, with a bar graph showing the whole team and how many billable hours they worked. And of course, part of this was the pressure to have high number of billable hours. Um, so that was the kind of experience I got there. But also, these big firms, they have deep top pockets, and they have methodologies. They have um, a lot of training resources. So if you want to develop in any number of ways, they have a formal program. They have formal mentorship and things like that. So it's a very structured um, and, and sort of rich environment to be in. I then went to a smaller consulting firm with only, say, 10 or I think 10 to 14 people, uh, working mostly with older folks or people who had maybe 10 or 20 years experience on me, which is beneficial because I got to learn from them. Uh, at, at the same time, I was doing, you know, some of the grunt work or a lot of the grunt work, uh, but, but that, that learning was very important to me. There weren't the structured resources in place, so I really had to be proactive in, say, wanting to take a pro uh, project management course or wanting to develop my career because it was a small consulting firm and it was private. Uh, we actually also worked very hard um, and the emphasis there was on billable hours. And a lot of times, an incentive structure, the, the incentive structure of a company will tell you what they're uh, focusing on. So this company, you know, would give you bonuses based on how many billable hours you worked, which sometimes is not good because that takes the sort of, it takes the emphasis away from quality, maybe, and puts it more on quantity. I then went to a medium-sized consulting firm, which uh, was about 150 people. Um, and is that what I did? No. Then I went to an 850 person consulting firm, uh, which was good. It was sort of uh, in the middle, but they did so many different things that um, I was sort of pulled all over the place. So I, I guess, you know, what kind of company you want to go to depends on, you know, what you're after and what your personality um, is like. A lot of people like to work with a lot of people the same age as them, or they really want to take in a lot of the formal training and designations and things like that. But, but yeah, there are vast differences. Yeah, the big model in, in consulting is out there. You kind of got up or out. Up or out. You know, you either graduate gradually or you go away. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the two choices. And uh, by the way, one of the terms I tell people is senior consultant equals junior consultant. <laughs> so in other words, the senior consultant are the grunts, the, the people mm -hmm. who are going to do the 120 hours a week. Mm -hmm. and if you work it out, every consultant, according to Caliper, is, is supposed to generate between two and four hundred thousand dollars each consultant uh, over the company, and it works out that to do that you have to work uh, more than the number of work days in a year. It's two twenty, just the basis, which is three times your salary, which is the minimum people want. So people who start in consulting work very hard. The good news is you get a huge amount of experience, and don't do it when you're old. I mean, do it when you're young. It's you know you just surviving that at age thirty or forty. Uh, at the very beginning would be extraordinarily difficult, mm -hmm. so it's uh, quite challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the, uh, the only other question um, or point I'd like to make is <clears throat> in terms of types of consulting, uh, more and more consultants are moving past the advisory role as per the Wikipedia definition into uh, the facilitative role. In other words, not just tell people what to do, 
but help them to do it. You see ads on television now mm -hmm. about we don't just tell you the solution, we do the solution. And that movement is where you become uh, more of an agent of change, more of a facilitator, more of a, uh, you know, a method where the company actually gets the product implanted, not just handed to them. So. Yes, and that's one of the criticisms of consulting. Um, I'm not going to my BlackBerry because I'm addicted. I have a joke for you. Um, one of the criticisms of consulting is that you know, consultants will come, they'll give you this big report, and then it's shelved. You pay an awful lot for a report that's shelved. So, I mean, to Dominic's point, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. We're doing a lot more of that, too, actually, executing and operationalizing the plans. So you get humorous emails? Is that what this is? No, no. I actually, I actually uh, have a joke specifically for you <laughs> while we're talking about sort of the downsides of consulting. See, often the, the perception, uh, I'm not reading the, I'm looking for it right now, often the perception of consultants is... Uh, not too dissimilar to that of lawyers. You know, you hear a lot of lawyer jokes, and people want to think that lawyers are, you know, so evil. And, and often people will think that of of, uh, of consultants as well, because often you'll get paid a, a good amount of money, and you know, you'll be working for a client who, you know, uh, probably makes less money than they're paying you for, even though you're not seeing all of it. So there's, you know, you 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 can be faced with a lot of sort of neg negativity. So I will I will end off with a joke, unless there are more questions. So here's a joke about consultants called The Shepherd and the Consultant. A shepherd was herding his flock in a remote pasture when suddenly a brand new BMW advanced out of the dust cloud towards him. The driver, a young man in an Armani suit, Gucci shoes, and Harry Rosen tie, leaned out the window and asked the shepherd, If I tell you exactly how many sheep you have in your flock, will you give me one? The shepherd looked at the man, obviously a yuppie, then looked at his peacefully grazing flock and calmly answered, Sure. The yuppie parked his car, whipped out his IBM ThinkPad, and connected it to his cell phone. Then he surfed to a NASA page on the internet where he called up a GPS satellite navigation system, scanned the area, and then opened up a database in an Excel spreadsheet with a complex formulas. He sent an email on his Blackberry, and a few minutes later received a response. Finally, he prints out a 130-page report on his miniaturized printer, then says to the shepherd, you have exactly 1,586 sheep. That's correct, said the shepherd. He watches the young man select one of his animals and bundle it into his car. Then the shepherd says, if I tell you exactly what your business is, will you give me back my animal? Okay, why not, answered the young man. Clearly you're a consultant, said the shepherd. That's correct, says the yuppie, but how did you guess that? No guessing required, answers the shepherd. You turned up here, although nobody called you. You want to get paid for an answer I already know to a question I never asked, and you don't know crap about my business. Now give me back my dog. <laughs> <laughs> good, very good. So that's how I'll close off. And, and I'll just remind you, if you have any questions or and want to follow up with me about anything at all, just feel free to contact me. Well, Julie, thank you very much. And other than cutting this so that it doesn't get broadcast to Sarnia, which I'm now worried about having <laughs> Oops. picked on that. And, and then I don't know how I ever was a consultant because nobody likes me. I'm glad you really <laughs> like you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.